Hey, Jim Toscano here, and welcome to the Monday Night Live Stream, Filling in the Grooves. I have a special guest tonight that I'm going to announce in just a moment. A few things I want to mention before we get going is um, my guest tonight, who's also um, a Sabian artist and a Prologic or, uh, artist, and so we share that in common. And um, so I want to thank those companies, Prologic's Percussion and Sabian Symbols. And, of course, uh, Offset Pedals, Black Magic Designs. Uh, if you're new to my streams, there's a link tree QR code right there. You can click that, and uh, it'll take you out to all my links. And, of course, my Kitco site, if you're interested in the technology side, there's lots of great goodies up there to look at. And you can join my mailing list by following the QR code on the bottom. And... Um, and, of course, a shameless plug for my book, Filling in the Grooves. Have to do it. Must do it. And I also want to plug a few other things. Um, Liberty DeVito's biography is amazing. Get it on audio and print. I have both. Here's my my print book. Um, but I have it on audio as well. It's really fun listening to Liberty um, read his own book and tell those stories. And um, the the other books I want to mention, I forgot to bring them down again, is Steve Gadd's new book, Gadiments. Uh, very, very cool. Get your hands on that. My buddy Joe Bergamini put out uh, the drummer's chart book. 
Uh, I hope I said the title correct. I might pull up the Hudson app a little later in the in the live stream um, just to show you the covers of those things. But um, so Joe Bergamini's books are awesome. He's got lots of uh, books and DVDs, but that one in particular is his newest endeavor, and it's very cool. So anyway, um, without any further ado, I want to introduce um, my friend and drummer, uh, singer, voiceover artist, um, very talented man, educator, uh, Jim Mola, who is on the faculty at uh, Drummers Collective in New York City here. He's also the president of the New York chapter of PAS. And so we have to address him as Mr. President uh, for the entire live stream. And he's a, he's a really talented singer as well. And I learned that he plays ukulele, which, which I think is pretty interesting. Like, who knew that he plays the ukulele? So I'm about to bring him in. He has to unmute his microphone because I muted him while he was, while he was putting on his, um, his evening gown. And um, yeah, man. So um, without any further ado, unmute that microphone. And here is myself and Jim Mola. There he is. Oh, let me make your full screen. There he is. Look at this handsome devil. You're still muted, by the way. I think you shut your mic off before you went to. Uh... Oh. <laughs> well, we had him. We had him before. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. There he is. You know, it's it never ends with the technology thing. <laughs> it's I, just. I, 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 I want, to, I want to tell everyone, first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for tuning in. And I want to liken what happened before, we, before you went live. Uh, was kind of like having a heart attack in the waiting room of the hospital. Like it was, thank God you were there. Thank God I was where I was because everything just kind of shut down and I was in a flop sweat seven minutes ago. So, um, <laughs> well, I'm on the right show with the right guy. It happens to the to the best of us. And, you know, I will say that um, I think it was a few weeks ago I had Daniel Glass on the show and right. we went live and I didn't have his audio. And mm -hmm. it turned out that it was something I did on my end. <laughs> and so we were about five minutes into the show, no audio. So, you know, I do enough of this technology stuff. I said, okay, everybody will be right back. I put on a be right back screen, troubleshooted, stayed calm. Five minutes later, we were back. Everything was good. So whenever whenever it hits the fan, stay calm, and you can do it. You know, I, playing drums for a thousand years as I have, it's like if it rains, if the power goes out, who cares? Right. You just play. Let the guitar player worry about his, you know, and the PA and everything. Once you start doing this, it's it's a whole other ball game. Yeah. And I know a lot of people that have come to really depend on you for this <laughs> well thank you and um yes and continue it's it's really funny people keep reaching out and yeah. i will say that most recently my friend uh enrique bugs gonzalez the drummer of los lobos mm -hmm. reached out to me he's moved to mexico and he's setting up his new rig and so once again it's like i put together a shopping list i need you to go over it so i know what gear to buy and um you know Everybody's still figuring this stuff out, man. You know, over a year in, right? I, we're a year in now. Look, I, I've been recording myself at home for forever. Right. My, this Apollo is a first generation Apollo. And I, you know, I feel like I know it like the back of my hand. And yet, two minutes to air, I'm looking <laughs> at cameras and iPhones attached to USB cables. And I'm saying, why is there no sound? Why is there no sound? I, I've had this thing for 15 years. So it, it's a whole new ballgame like every day. Plus, as I said to you earlier, I'm usually on another floor in our house doing this. Right. And because my wife is out of town, this is, you know, when the cat's away, this is how the rat plays. I move into the living room, you know, <laughs> and set up the drums, and everyone's stubbing their toes on the cymbal stands going like, Daddy, why? Um, <laughs> and everything changes. You know, it's like nothing's dialed in. Everything is absolutely different once you move everything and plug it all back in again. Yeah. So, yeah. It's like you yeah. change rooms and you start going, how does all my gear work again? I don't know what I'm doing. It's yeah. just amazing. Yeah. That's or, you know, you have that panic moment when you're about to go live as, as with this kind of stuff. And, and like that night with Daniel Glass, I was like, 
How do inputs work? I don't remember what inputs do. You just have that little sense of panic. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, they I've made your way into the shot. I'm seeing. So... <laughs> oh, that's okay. good. <laughs> Daisy is down here now. I guess she's feeling lonely. Sorry. Uh well, that's fine. We 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 love pets. Sometimes I'm I'm on with Dom helping him with this stuff, and there's a bunch of dogs running through the they, studio. Like Charmaine is raising them, right, or something? Well, not raising them. They foster them, and and so, and most of the time they're fostering dogs that are that are really, um, in bad shape. And sometimes at like sort of end of life kind of stage stuff. And um, man, God bless them. They they really do an amazing job. Oh, oh look at that. Not for this to happen, but she's she's coming over and saying, you know, she wants me to pet her. And this never <laughs> Daisy made your, your debut tonight. There you go. <laughs> That's awesome. Now so, she's going to go. Goodbye. Yeah, well, Cooper, Cooper is on my, my standby screen, my, my uh, golden doodle. So... He you is the standby screen, so he he gets a uh, he gets airtime every week. <laughs> um, so I want to just quickly, I think you know, you and I really. What's funny is you know you were living in New York for a while. Um, you you grew up in Connecticut, um, correct? But like we really didn't bump into each other or run into each other. I don't think until PASIC, like a bunch right. of years ago. And I think we actually officially met at PASIC. So it figures we met in either, you know, either San Antonio or Indianapolis, probably Indianapolis. And yeah. and then have seen each other there every year since. About PAS. It's just, it really is. Of all the great things that PAS does, that's one of the best things about PASIC is that, you know, life here is hectic. You and I live a matter of miles apart. I was in your neighborhood, like, 48 hours ago but there's no time you don't you know you're rushing through in every place and then you go out there and everyone you love and haven't seen in a long time and old friends and new friends you just kind of hang out and uh, it's one of the best things that PAS is for I think yeah un unbelievable and you know those without PASIC I think you know we wouldn't have the as big a bond that we have in the drumming community I, I it definitely helps to cement that bond because you actually get to physically get together every year on a thing that's just for drummers and percussionists, which is amazing, right? So, and there's I know it's a lot, but but drummers do this, and not a lot of instrumentalists do this. No. I mean, every, you know, everyone loves to talk about their instrument, but there's a thing among drummers that is, I think, unusual, and maybe it's because there's only one drummer in a band usually that we're not feeling like we're competing for each other's gigs or maybe i don't know i don't know what it is but there's a bond between drummers there's a brotherhood i think that's you know kind of unusual yeah i i say it every week and um and everybody's sick of it and and it's and it's old now but i always make the comparison to bassoon players i i doubt that there's any bassoon player hangs <laughs> that that we know of maybe just a few at, at juilliard maybe i don't know but you know, the, the bond is, is not as strong. Guitar players would be stabbing each other in the back. Yeah, yeah there's not 5,000 of them in Indianapolis every year. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Double reads. So president, Mr. President of the New York I, chapter. That's so cool. I've given this a lot of thought, and I think, you know, you and I know each other a long time, so you can just call me your excellency. <laughs> nice. I love that, it. That would be good. <laughs> um, you know... Uh, I've been a member of PAS since the 80s, I think, was my first PAS. Wow. Um, and, yeah, I've been going a long time. And, y you know, you get to know a lot of people. You get to see a lot of friends. It's, it's, it's Nam without the guitar picks, you know. And, and it's, it's just a great place for drummers to get together, like you said. Um, and in the old days, way old days, you know, I would sit in on the drum set committee meetings. and. Right. Just check them out, you know, and just, and in those days it was Steve Houghton and Ed Sof and, and, you know, and all those cats. And they were kind of making the trajectory of where things were going to go. And, um, and it was a great thing to watch, but I didn't really feel attached to it. I felt like I was observing it, you know, I felt, it was, you know, but it was great. It was a great thing to watch and watch those cats do what they do. And they're well, knowledgeable and, you know, and great. Um, and then I just went. I just went to PAS every year. I think I've missed two since like 87 or something ridiculous like that. Wow. Uh, 
Yeah. And it's just, I'm there. I just go and I see everybody and... You know, sometimes I'm hanging around in the in the uh, the exhibit hall, and I f I miss a lot of clinics, and sometimes I'm at every clinic. But then I joined the drum set committee, and I, uh, committee, and I got a real kind of inside sense of how things work. I mean, Eric Hughes does an amazing job with yeah. the drum set. Oh my God! Um, and there's just so many great people in that committee. You know, Dave Stanick and Jason Gianni and, and a lot of, some guys have actually aged out this year, uh, they fulfilled their terms, but there's new people like Colleen Clark that are coming in. I mean, it just keeps getting better. It just keeps getting better. And the time that I've been there, I just keep watching it get better. Um, and then all of a sudden, I got this email like everyone else got that said, we're having chapter elections and you know, vote for someone. If you want to nominate someone that you think would be good, nominate them. If you think you want to try it, nominate yourself. And I don't know what possessed me, but I just went, I think I can do that. I think I can do that. And I really felt strongly like I had a really clear idea. And I don't usually do anything unless I have like a clear view of where I think it can go. Um, but it just, it, it was like a light went off and it was like PAS, New York chapter. And I thought, it, it's not that I can do it. It's just I, I thought I knew what the PAS chapter in New York City, in New York State, really New York State, um, what we could and should be. And I just thought, look at all the talent. Look at all the educators like yourself and Peter Reslaff and Jason and just just the staff at the collective. Just in that one little building, you've got some of the most amazing educators anywhere. And then, you know, I started to think like in pockets of people, like look at all the Afro-Cuban musicians, Bobby Sanabria and all these, oh, yeah. just whole schools of people, all the great jazz drummers that we have, all the great educators, uh, you know, in, in the SUNY system and upstate and people that don't maybe get a lot of face time, you know, in, in wherever, but they're in there every day and they just have so much to contribute. And I went, this is a no brainer. It's like, PAS New York should be the shining light of what a, a PAS chapter could be. Like that was really, I know it sounds corny and sometimes I think in corny terms, but that kind of stuck in my head. And I, you know, and then I started thinking all the great mallet players we have, you know, oh, yeah. I, it's like you look at all these different schools of things that we've got and it's like, we should be doing a lot of stuff. We should be drawing tons of people in and tons of drummers, tons of percussionists, tons of young kids. Um, uh, you know, I had a, I have a, until COVID kind of knocked it out last year, but I've been doing a drum camp uh, with Scott Latsky. I don't know if you know Scott, um, but he runs the uh, percussion program at the Fieldston School. Um, and I, you know, it was because of PAS that I came to him and I said, you know, we should, he's, uh, okay, let me preface this by saying he has an amazing percussion program. Um, you know Diane Downs by any chance? Okay, so Diane is just the best, right? And, and she's now taken the leopards to like new heights. Yeah. But Scott has also been very quietly doing a very similar thing in, you know, in his school. And no one knows about it. In fact, um, our very dear departed Arnie Lang, uh, he and I were on the phone one day and we were talking about uh, this school and he said, you're, you're running a drum camp up there? He said, you, you, should, you should write an article about that. You should write for percussive notes. So Scott does this amazing program and I said to him, we should do a drum camp. In the summer, we should get these kids and put them in a room and do a great drum camp. And we mat we decided to max it out at 25 and we sold it out. We, we did it two weeks uh, and sold it out and it was great. And every kid, it was like the football team used to be. Every kid wanted to be in percussion ensemble and every kid wanted to play mallets. The kids were crushing marimba parts. I mean, it, wow. it was so exciting to see. So I thought, this is, I mean, this is something I've had my hands in now for some years now, uh, and it's been really successful. So let's, let's try and blow this up. Let's see if we can get the same, you know, 10, 12 to 15, 17 year old people um, interested in not just playing drums, not just playing beats, not just playing grooves, but also in playing music on percussion instruments, you know, and it was just it was like, I, seriously, this light went off and I went, I'm going to try this. I might completely fall on my face. Um, 
it's a lot of work, you know, and, and, you know, it's not an easy job, but, uh, yeah, but I'm, ex I'm really excited about it. I really am. Um, I have a great, you know, I have a great team so far. Uh, we're still assembling, uh, Tom Marceau and Rob Bridge, uh, and we're actually still looking for one more person to fill it out. But these guys are serious educators, you know, wow. and they've been in the trenches doing this for, for decades. They know their stuff. They know how to teach. And what was funny was that um, literally the day after I was, I became president. Um, uh, so my, my, I, well, I'm not going to say. It. So, uh, so the day I became president, so I, I got to be careful. So the day I became president, I want to say I was elected president. The day I became president, uh, I got an email from uh a, a percussionist who had been involved in the chapter. And she said, well, here's a bunch of emails that haven't been answered. Welcome to the show. <laughs> and I, and I, I answered one of the emails the next morning. And this woman wrote back a, as if I had just, you know, given her the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes. She went, oh my God, this is great. Oh, you, thank you for answering me. And right away, she wanted us to do a presentation at her, you know, education. Uh, she's part of NISMA, you know. Oh, for, you know yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. Um, but she was waiting. She was waiting for like something to happen. She was waiting for someone to get in touch with her and be excited about what she was excited about. And so we've already set up our first, you know, conference for the summer uh, of, you know, of getting, uh, of doing percussion instruction for non-percussionists, you know, all these trumpet right. players and clarinet players who are now teaching, you know, bands and things and don't always know how to deal with the drummers. So it's, it's actually... I'm surprised at myself that it's as exciting to me as it is, but I just feel like, you know, it, we have so much to offer. The state, the, the talent pool is just so huge that all you really have to do is just kind of go, you know, look, look at this, look at that. And I think it's going to draw, I think it's going to draw people. So, um, and it sounds like it's in the right hands now, <laughs> well, I, you know, I mean, I, I, I have ideas, you know, I mean, um, Rob is going to be doing a lot of the social media, you know, the thing about a thing like this is that, um, it's great to be an idea person. It's great to go. Wouldn't it be great if we put on a show in my uncle's garage? Yeah, that would be great. Um, that's, that's great to have big ideas, but the practicality is where most things get kind of bogged down Yeah, and dealing with, with artists and fees and, uh, instruments and cartage and spaces to play in and all that stuff. I mean, it's a lot. There's a lot of really kind of dry clerical who's watching the money, who's watching the chapter finances. I mean, you know, it's like the people are going to be working really hard behind the scenes like they do at PAS. Right. You know, you and I go there and we see a great clinic and then, you know, we go next door to the next clinic and then we go upstairs to a master class and then we go across the street and we have a beer and then we, you know, and, but the thing is like at PAS, there are hundreds probably of people that are working really hard behind the scenes that are totally invisible. Right. And that's where I have to kind of learn and uh, lean on those people because some of those things are not my strength. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just, just just watching how things run at PAS and watching at PASIC and watching just the logistics teams. The logistics team, those cats work like, so hard. And a lot yeah. of them are, are their interns, their kids, you know, and, and, and not to sound pejorative about that, but I mean, they're young people and, and they're just working relentlessly, you know, moving and hauling and, and kicking a marimba of four flights and down three escalators. I mean, it's really amazing. And that, and, you know, the convention centers are big places. So it, yeah. it's a lot of work. And I'm, I'm just, I'm excited about, you know, at least wanting to present this is the thing. My 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 little chat, my little uh, quote that I put on that we didn't have an Instagram page, so I made one. And please go like it or whatever you do on Instagram. Um, and actually, I'll I'll make sure that when we wrap today, I'm going to get all the links and I'll put yeah. them in the description of this video so people can find it easily. Because we're, we're, we're ju really just getting rolling. It was the spring when, you know, I got put in and I knew who my officers were. Uh, they, they were actually a little while after me. Um, and like I said, we're still looking for some people. Uh, 
So it, it's been, and everyone's busy. You know, these guys are teaching school. It's the end of the year. Yep. There's a lot going on. But we've had some meetings already. We've had some great meetings, some productive meetings. Um, we had some meetings with Joshua and the team at PAS who are just amazing. And they have their own ideas about how they want to take PAS forward. And it affects the chapter. So some, some things that have been done a certain way over the, over the decades are now changing. The days of percussion and all that other stuff. And it's really, it's getting tighter. And I think it's getting better. I think it's just going to be great. And, um, you know, we've got, we've got Dave Stark down in Florida. And we've got yeah. uh, some great, we just have great people uh, who were really just dedicated to this. And I think it's going to be fun. I think it's going to be fun. And just come to our social media, sign up, join up. If you see we're doing something, please check it out. Because my plan is to, uh, like this what I started to say, is my, my little saying is that I want to have the chapter rise to the level of our talent pool. That's, right. that's my only goal. It's like, how do I get our chapter to reflect this, you know, I mean, it's amazing who's who's in the New York City area. So I want to try and get all of them if I can. I want to call in favors and, and, you know, wave whatever I have to wave at people to kind of go, come on, you know, do a clinic and teach these kids some stuff. And um, what's happened in percussion over the years is is amazing. I mean, we all see it. You know, we all see, you know, the four and seven and ten year olds on Instagram who are just crushing it. You yeah. Know? Um, I don't think there's ever been a more exciting time for drummers. I don't. And I, I think uh, a lot of this has to do with social media because they have that instant platform to put themselves out there. They put, they're putting up videos. There's these young kids that are putting up videos daily <laughs> and just feeding, feeding the machine. And it's more kids are coming to the table because of that. Yeah. And I'm putting up pictures of the pizza that I had last night, you know, because I'm a dinosaur, you know, I, <laughs> I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get this together. Um, but you know, uh, but yeah, these young kids, it's very natural for them. Even my own kids who, you know, left here in a, in a flurry, uh, right before I, I stumbled into the drum set, uh, I sent them to a restaurant and I was, please just, just go, just go. Um, but you know, it's like my 11 year old, it, it's all very natural and they all get it and they're all doing it. Now, the one thing I will also, I would be very, I think negligent if I didn't say this is that we just talked about all the great things that the internet does, all the great things, all the great things you can see. Um, you know, I've been telling students for years, you know, when I was a boy and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not, not, I'm not 20 anymore, but, you know, records used to come out once a year by your favorite artist. Right. The Beatles record a year, John Coltrane, well, no, he was gone before I was aware of it. But, you know, I mean, jazz records, record companies release albums and one new every year. Yeah. Um, I was talking with some friends. I had some, some musicians over here the other day to play. And um, we were talking about how when we were teenagers, you know, and you're really, you're fairly serious about your instrument and you're studying and you're practicing and you're playing um, and you're listening to records, you're listening to records. But at that point, uh, I remember one thing that sticks out in my head is that I didn't believe that Sam Rivers had ever played with Miles Davis because I'd never seen any proof of it. And people go, oh yeah, man, he was in Miles' band. I go, no, oh, come on, it was Wayne Shorter and John Coltrane. No, 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 it was Sam Rivers. Well, someone had to join the, 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 you know, the, the Harry James band or the Glenn Miller band and go to Japan and get an out of print record that was being released only in Japan by Blue Note and then bring it back and we'd all make a cassette and then we'd all sit in the room and listen to it together and go, that's Sam Rivers with Miles. So people today, young people today don't have that. They right. have everything. They kind of go, oh yeah, Sam and Miles. Yeah, here it is right here. <laughs> they have access to everything. And it's amazing. And we're seeing the, the, the fruit of that in the way they're playing. And these young geniuses now are being nurtured in a way that they probably never have been before. Now, obviously, Mozart was four years old and playing what he was playing. There's always been talented prodigies. Um, and there's always been talented young people. You know, I mean, I remember there was a kid who played organ. He was a few years younger than me, and I was probably 12. And he used to come to my house and with a B3. He'd bring his B3 to my basement and a Leslie. And this kid was stunning. It was just like light years beyond, you know, what he sounded like Joey DeFrancesco. Um, so th th that's always been there. But now, like you say, it's about, it's about the exposure. And, you know, you post every day. Um, 
so we didn't have that, but, but there's one thing we did have that young people don't have. And this is what I feel is important to say. You have to be in a room with musicians and you have to make music. Yeah. Because the, the downside, the, 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 you know, I don't want to be dark about it, but the, but the, the, the danger of it is that when you're sitting in a room by yourself and you have great lights, you know, I looked at my lights, they're not so great, but they're okay. But you know, you have a room and you have great lights and you get your mics together and you have, you know, and you have all your technology together. And then you go to YouTube and you're copying and you're studying and you're learning and you're, you know, practicing and you're putting it and you're posting and you got followers. That's its own animal, right? That's its own thing. But when you are playing music from a young age and you're your goal is to learn how to play the instrument so that you can play with musicians, not play in your room, not play and get the levels right, you know, for Instagram. It, but when you're playing on a bandstand with musicians, all the drummers in the room might go, man, did you see that thing he did? But the band leader who's a saxophone player is going to turn around and go, uh-uh, not here. <laughs> right. Not, don't, you want to be here tomorrow night? Don't do that. Yeah, not on my gig. Not on my gig. So what's the, you know, the disconnect there is that we're all playing for other drummers now, you know, it's like, and the drummers are going, man, that guy's amazing. I want to learn more about what he's doing, but it has to be tempered. And this is, I have always, always, because it was how I was taught in my teaching, I'm, I'm making musicians. I'm interested in making musicians. The, the teachers at the collective, Jason and Peter and, and everybody there, Fred Klatz, yep. Fred Klatz is teaching people how to read not to be great readers, but to be great musicians who can read music really well. You know what I mean? It was everything there was geared towards making music with other musicians. And that has to be the goal. So if you're a young phenom and you're, you're getting a lot of followers, I, I love you and I applaud you and I'm probably following you, but find a bass player in your neighborhood. Find someone who, just find someone who owns a guitar. Find someone who is maybe on your same level, whatever that may be. If, you know, if you're, if you're a little monster, find another little monster. And right. if you're just kind of really kind of plodding along and really want to do it, find someone else like that. Because you're going to get so good by playing with musicians. And this is the thing that I think, you know, uh, the world has changed. You know, there aren't as many gigs. It's a harder thing. I, I, you know, you and I are not far apart, so far apart in age. I'm older than you, but not that much. Not that um, much. But, you know, we, 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 we had access. There were bands. There were bands in restaurants. There were bands in nightclubs. There were bands that did tours. There were bands that recorded. There were, you know, I mean, there were just, there were musicians working. It's a little different now. It's harder, I think, to find as many harder. gigs. Sure, it's a lot harder. But... That doesn't change the fact that if you get into a room, find a song that you all know, write some songs. They don't have to be, you know, John McLaughlin songs. They just write a song together. You're going to learn so much by watching a guitar player trying to figure out the chord to play. It's going to change the way you play. And if it doesn't, you're not paying attention. Right. If, if the way the bass player plays a line doesn't change the, what you play on the drums, you are not listening. And this is, well, not my headphones necessarily, but this is what you need to develop. And so that's, I mean, I'm, now I'm on a full-blown preach here, but <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but I, I think that's what has to happen. You know, yeah. we want people playing drums. We want people, we're in a, um, a complete renaissance of instrument making. I, it's amazing. It's amazing how great instruments are getting, you know? I mean, yeah. I'm actually, now, not this drum set here. This is, this is something, this is attached to my heart and soul. These are my Gretsch drums, These are, you know, from the 80s. But um, I have, a, I have a, a 50s three-ply round badge kit. Don't write me letters, angry letters, please. <laughs> I love this drum set, 22, 13, 16, and I'm actually considering selling it um, to buy some new... Gretsch drums because Gretsch is crushing it. I mean, yeah. Gretsch drums are so good. I've been a Gretsch guy my whole life. I don't have an endorsement. I'm not, there's no deal for me to say that. It's just, you know, um, 
but everyone is just making such great instruments yeah. you know so so you're 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 alive at such a wonderful time if you're just coming to this and just learning you know i mean there's you got so much going for you you have so much information you have people like yourself who are doing what you're doing right now with with a thousand people and great people who have things to say um and there are other podcasts. I mean, there's just so much. I know it's hard to get overwhelmed, not to get overwhelmed, but there's just so much opportunity and so much information. And you just, it's like, it's like a buffet, man. <laughs> it's like, yeah. a, like a world-class buffet. But play music. Play music. Like, just, like you said, yeah. I mean, you know, the, the internet didn't come to be a thing until 1993. So before that, I would go into a record shop, I would pick up a record, I'd look on the back, read who played on the record, then look up that guy in the bin down the row and pick up that record and then look on the back of that one and draw these connections so Absolutely. organically, so slowly, obviously, because I would pick up a Billy Cobham record because yes. I saw that he played with Mahavishnu and then you know, making these connections, right? So now kids are just Wikipedia, pull up the discography, pull up the personnel. You could do it in two seconds. Yeah. And we really did have to kind of work for that knowledge. We had to work for that. But it was fun. I mean, it, you know, Adam Nussbaum is from my hometown, uh, as is Horace Silver, you know, and John Catrone, great drummer who lives out there, um, and Joe Corsello, great drummer who lives out there. Um, and we were all connected through, a, a, at one point or another, we all studied with, a, a, not Horace Silver, but we all studied with this teacher who I ended up studying with for a long time. His name was Tony Shirko. Um, and, you know, I, I loved him. I mean, he was just, he, he was just like a second father to me in some ways, you know. Uh, he was just a great, great guy. But he, he was kind of a visionary. He was kind of nuts and kind of a visionary in how he saw things. And he saw you know, so much about music. He taught me so much more about music than he did about drums. And that's not to say he didn't teach me about drums. He was into every bit of it. He studied with Henry Adler. He, you know, he, he, he watched everybody. He knew what everybody was doing. Um, you know, a lot of the things that everyone's kind of into now, he taught me about when I was 13, you know, so it, it's not like he didn't have the information, but it was always, always, always tied to music, right. always tied to music. Even, you know, even just the ride cymbal pattern. You know, it, it was about creating rhythmic stability. It wasn't about spang a lang and ding a ding. It was about creating rhythmic stability and how everything else moved off of that and created a counterpoint. He was always talking in musical terms. Anyway, uh, I was I remember being in a record store, it's a really hip record store run by a, a woman who just knew everybody. And, you know, a 12 year old girl would come in and she'd say, oh, you want the new record by, uh, you know, whoever. Oh, yeah, I'll get that. I, we have that. And she'd show her that. And then I'd come in and she'd go, oh, that Cecil Taylor record you were looking for is in. Yeah. She just knew everything. And I remember standing in that record store with Adam and we're side by side and we're flipping through the records, you know, and and Adam goes, man, you heard this one. And I went, no. He goes, yeah, this has been out of print forever, man. Joe Chambers crushes this record, man. And I went, OK. And that's all I needed to know. Right. Like Adam, Adam told me, buy that record. That was a and good Adam impression, by the way. Man, Adam, you know, man, Adam, I love Adam, man. He's got my hair cut, man, you know. <laughs> you know, I, you got to have the spang lang and the ding to ding man. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just not happening, man. <laughs> Adam, um, when, when, when COVID first hit and everything got locked down, uh, the collective uh, had me do a couple of... Uh, you know, a couple of things for them. And one was a tribute to, you know, my friend Jimmy Cobb, who had passed not long before. Um, and then I had, you mentioned Billy Cobb, I had Billy on and Adam uh, and Kelly Ray Tubbs and Peter Retzlaff popped on. Uh, and uh, and it was it was mostly about drumming in New York was kind of the, the intention of the thing. Um, but Adam was like a hero to me because he's just, he's enough older than me where... He was the first cat that any of us knew who had come from our hometown and moved to New York and boom, he was out there. You yeah. know, I mean, he, John Schofield and he was doing all these gigs and I would walk into the Sweet Basil or I'd walk into 7th Avenue South. This was a club, you know. Was the, I remember. Yeah. And I'd walk into 7th Avenue South and there's Adam 
playing with Gil Evans. I didn't know he was there. You know, I just walked in, but there's Adam, man. So, uh, you know, he's just such a gifted musician. But you listen to him, and he'll tell you, he was listening to, you know, Jimi Hendrix, and he was listening to blues records and classical music. He's a musician. He is a musician. And then he takes all that music that's inside of him, and he plays it here. And all the choices that he makes. Jack DeJohnette, you know, oh I... A, a thousand years ago, uh, I, I went up to Woodstock, and uh, it was an it was a s intensive, a percussion intensive for two weeks or a month, I forget what. Um, but it was uh, Jack, Trelock Gertu, oh my god, uh, Ayub Diang, Nano Vasconcelos, um, Colin Walcott from Kadona, you know, from Oregon, um, and Ed Blackwell, and oh Ed Blackwell. God. And it was just, it was the most amazing experience. But none of those guys talk to you about paradiddles. Right. None of you talk, none of them talk to you about, you know, seven against five and three. It was none of that. It was listening to music. It was playing. It was playing time. It was orchestration. I mean, and whatever their thing was, Trelock, you know, I mean, and listen, Indian music is highly complex and very mathematic if you look at it that way. Right. But at the end, you know, there are no funkier drummers on the planet than a South Indian Murdungam player. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like, it's like listening to Clyde Stubblefield, you know. Um, and that guy was playing like sort of a hybrid drum set slash tabla Thing, like this wacky thing really oh, tr trelock is yeah just... trelock is like amazing and and the thing was he was really you know i was 20 years old i guess um and he was a real eye-opener because he was always thinking about music but he was totally interested in drums he was yeah. totally interested in you know he i remember he wanted to learn how to play a um i can't do it but he had worked up this thing that was like you know like that yeah um and he would do that on the snare drum while he's playing this other stuff. And it, I mean, so he was technically very astute and totally in, involved and enmeshed in music and in drums. But what he heard was, you know, he heard Jan Garbaric saxophone in the background. That's what he played too in his head, you know. So that's the thing. I mean, we just, I just don't want anyone to forget that, that music is a social thing. You know, that it's about playing with musicians and it's about playing with musicians, hopefully for people. Right. And, you know, and that's like, I don't know. I'm really ranting here. I'm so sorry. That's all right. <laughs> but you know what I think we should do is because yes. usually by the halfway point, I jump into the chat. And so okay. I want to just see if, if there's any questions in the chat. Say hello to some people. Let some people say hello to you. Um, so, of course, we're speaking with drummer, educator, singer, voiceover artist Jim Mola. Uh oh. Also, um, Mr. President, uh, New York chapter of uh, PAS, new, newly appointed, pretty much, right? Newly appointed, yes. Yeah. I ran unopposed. That was my joke. I didn't want to say it. I, I was hesitant to say it earlier, but I ran unopposed. So that's why <laughs> I don't say elected because I ran unopposed. Well, I'm going to go back to the top of the list. So Pat Ross was the first one in here saying hello. Pat Ross, I hope your knee is getting better. Thanks for hanging with us. Um, Janine is here. Uh, from O for Drum Sake. Do you know Janine Canino Fox? Fantastic. Janine hanging with us, and she does a great podcast. Also, O for Drum Sake. She's also reposting every drummer that she finds on on uh, Instagram that she likes. She's reposting everybody. It's really a beautiful thing. Um, mm -hmm. Lucia Rose Seminara, my young student, is in here, and she said, "Good evening, Jim and Jim. Uh, how you all doing tonight?" So. Um, Welcome to the Jim and Jim show. Um, Anthony Michelli, greetings all. Um, hey. Let me see. What's that, Woody? <laughs> is Mola putting on hit? Oh, is Tux? <laughs> I heard about that. I heard you wore a Tux to Eric's uh, podcast. I did. Well, he had given me such a buildup that I felt I really needed to do something. So <laughs> I... I I walked from behind the camera. I put on the James Bond theme, theme, and I sat down in a tuxedo with a bow tie. And wow! And as soon as the song ended, I untied the bow tie, and I was done. That was, <laughs> but it was it was worth it for the anything for a laugh. It was worth a gag. Absolutely, uh, Anthony Cusina. Hey, Jim and Jim, hanging with us. 
Um, all of the first uh, installations in this chat are everybody saying hello to everybody else, which is very nice. That's what our community is all about. Joey Pinto's yeah. in here, hanging. John Gill, hey Jim and Jim, greetings from Oneonta, New York. Right. Um, let's see, going through. Lucia said, my bassoon joke will never get old. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. um, so right. Anthony, Anthony has a question for you. He said, hey Jim, what are some of the pros and cons that you've experienced throughout the COVID period? Wow. That's a loaded question. <laughs> Anthony's a thoughtful cat. Uh, Anthony, and go, Anthony and I go way back. I mean, and, and you know, the thing is, he's a great, uh, he, he loves drums and he's a great patron of everything that we do. He's always in all of these events, you know. He is. Um, he's a sweetheart. He's a, and I he, helped him with his teaching rig and he's really built a beautiful teaching rig. Yeah, he's a very knowledgeable drummer. He's, you know, is a wonderful drummer, wonderful player, wonderful teacher. Yep. And, and he was always at the collective, which is where I met him. You know, he was at every master class. I'd see him all the time. Uh, the pros and cons of the, of the, of COVID. I mean, you know, I, I guess, I, I guess the pros might be obvious, you know, and that is that people came to you and they, you know, they figured, um, I'm not going to stop because my gig stopped. Right. Um, and they, they just started playing online. Um, you know, there's a musician that I know who really went after in a negative way all of these musicians who were doing these home concerts and putting out their virtual tip jar on Venmo or whatever. And he just went, come on, man, this is terrible. And I went, H how dare you? <laughs> right. How dare you? It's like these people, this is what they all live for. And they're just, they're, they're going to keep doing it. So they do it from home. I thought it was great. And, and I, 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 you know, I made a point of calling out, you know, just some great musicians who I knew who had been doing that. Um, you know, uh, Peter Reslev has built an amazing rig in his home, yep. you know, um, and I know you're going to have him on soon. Next um, week, yeah. He's, he, he and I, it's funny, he and I have become so, so much closer in the last year than we did bumping into each other in the halls for 10 years before that, you know, but we talk all the time. I was on the phone with him for an hour last night. He's built an amazing setup in his house, yeah. um, you know, and, and uh, people just, adapted you know I, I had a business venture years ago with a with a guy who was not a musician uh, but he was kind of in the the financial end of what we were doing uh, it was a performance venue and and whenever we'd come into a problem he would go champions adjust man champions adjust and we kind of laughed like oh, that's a corny non-musician thing to say it was like a businessman thing to say but he's right champions adjust and that's what people have done they've adjusted this whole thing has happened because of covid this horrifying thing that's happened to our planet um people are you know making something out of it they're making they're making something beautiful out of it so that's to call that an upside is such an understatement because to me it's just this massive triumph of people not taking no for an answer and just saying, I want to play, and 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 and, there's, and it's become its own thing. I mean, obviously, the downside of it is, you know, um, <laughs> I sat for the better part of fourteen months just over there at my dining room table, while my son sat five feet away from me at his desk, and I sat there every day, and I did what I could do on my laptop and did my work and answered my emails and edited audio whatever i happened to be doing um and making sure he wasn't playing video games during math class <laughs> you know what i mean it's like it was so rough on kids it was yeah. uh, obviously you know if you've lost anyone i'm not making light of or selling that short we know what this was so you know I, i'm i'm strictly addressing kind of the downside of of not that desperate part of it but you know there's all this ancillary stuff um people kind of getting back into the world now I, there's a there's kind of a leeriness you, you see in people's you know it's going to take some time i think yeah. for people to you know shake hands and and you know and and feel normal and feel natural around other people and not have that kind of uh -oh, whoa you know that, it's going to take thing. some time but i feel like 
I feel like takes- we're turning the corner. You know, it's getting there. So, I mean, you know, to me, that's the downside. I mean, businesses were were decimated. Broadway, you know, I, I saw a great sta- a, a great quote from one of the Broadway musicians. Um, that's you know, someone said, "Why are we making such a big deal about these Broadway musicians?" You know, I mean, there's only a few hundred of them, and you know, Broadway has this kind of uh, you know, it's a t- it's a tight community, and it's not easy to break into. You know, it, it's just right. not. I mean, you really have to have a lot on the ball to be trusted to move into that community. You yeah. really do, and rightfully so, right? Because that's a tough gig, and a lot of people are depending on everyone doing their job every single night, eight times a week. So Broadway is kind of a close thing. Uh, and and someone said, why are we making such a big deal about all these Broadway people? There's only a few hundred of them. And, and someone said, you know what? There's only a few hundred of us, and we brought in $19 billion into New York State last year, New York City last year. Right. So you know what I mean? It's like that. people don't always think about this you know we're so we're so interwoven <laughs> you know um we are i mean our our economies and our 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 families and our friends i mean we're we're just we're really just closer to everyone than we think so we got to get everyone kind of back on track and everyone feeling better and and i think it ha- i think you're right i think it is happening um you know i think we we, we just went through something really difficult and i think we saw what people could accomplish during the difficult time. Yeah. And now I, th- I think, you know, we're, we're moving forward in a very positive way. And I, I, it's good to see people out. You know, I've been playing in Midtown Manhattan again. Um, and it's just, you have those moments where you're playing, you know, and you're forgetting kind of what's happening for a second. Cause I'm, I'm listening to the bass player and I'm, I'm listening to music and I see people in front of me and I'm going, Oh, it's almost normal again. So I, I, I'm very hopeful. I'm, I am very hopeful. Yeah, that man. Are- Same here. And um, Simon, uh, Simon Bjarning is in here tonight. Very cool. Hang with us. Larry Rizzo is here. Um, yeah. Happy Monday. Running a little late, but at least you're running. Excellent. <laughs> Kelly Ray Tubbs hanging. Very cool. Um, Anthony, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. So this is going back to our previous conversation where he was just saying, yes, music is meant to be played with other humans and um, yep. getting that interpersonal, you know, communication together. I'll tell you, man, sometimes with students, we'll just go down a listening rabbit hole. And before you know it, the hour is up. And I there's a part of me that feels like, oh, man, we didn't play. But it's it's so important to give that connection to kids. Like I, I have a young kid that's that's you know, becoming a fan of jazz. And basically every week I give him a tune to go look it up and listen to at least five different versions of the tune. I write down who each one of them is, and then we compare them and talk about the differences, you know. So it trying to get him to listen and really open his mind to it. So um, put what he's playing and play his new ride symbol pattern and right. you know, page seven of the Jim Chapin book, you know, um put that in context. Right. You know, and, and, and to remember that that the vocabulary that you're building, I, I um, some of my friends used to laugh at me. I had a uh, I, I had a thing I used to do in my clinics where, you know, if you memorized, let's say, I don't know, let's say whatever your favorite speech is, uh, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech or uh, whatever your favorite speech is, I don't care. Um, you know, if you memorize that and you became a total student of that 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 speech and you knew every nuance and you could reproduce it and uh you know and and you be, you watched every angle of every camera angle of every video taken that day when Martin Luther King gave that historic speech on the mall and you knew everything there was about it and you read books and history about it and then you're walking down the street and someone you haven't seen in 10 years and goes Jimmy man how are you doing and you said I have a dream he'd go wait what you know it, it's not the place for that right we read these books when we read you know no matter how great we memorize solos that's one of the ways we learn things we learn you know uh, and and we learn steve gadd solos and we i mean i used to memorize max roach solos uh and try to memorize buddy rich solos and try and memorize billy hart so whatever it was you know dom has that great thing uh what is it um Uh, imitation assimilation then innovation right right you have to learn by you know by studying great people um 
But then eventually you have to find your own voice and you have to be able in a musical context, you have to be able to meet the context that's happening in that moment. And that implies a tremendous amount of homework that implies memorizing all that stuff and learning all those different versions of soon tunes and seeing what can be done with a song. And then what's, what's the musician on the band staying with you right now doing with that song? Right. Cause if you're, if you're trying to do what you learned, if you're trying to do what you memorized, you've lost the moment. Well said, it, it, by the way, speaking of Dom, Dom's in here. Uh oh, and, and he says Jim Mola is a powerful force in drumming and drum educational. Fantastic! Thank you, Dom, for your enthusiasm. <laughs> I love you, like a brother. I, I, okay, you know sometimes we joke a lot because Dom and I go back thirty years, more than thirty years. Right. So, and we have a very similar sense of humor. So, it's humor, humor, a very similar <laughs> sense. Of humor. So, you know, we're, we joke around a lot. But I have to tell you. Um, I remember walking into uh, a, a place on the Upper West Side of Manhattan called the Latin Quarter, and a teacher remember. named, a musician named Frankie Malibu, if you remember Frankie. Remember Frankie, rest in peace. Tremendous musician, tremendous, you know, just life force. Yeah. And he, he was a part of the collective family, and he became sick, and there was a fundraiser for him on the Upper West Side at this club. But I remember that night, uh, among all the great musicians who played, um, Dom walked in and he had two blue and white boxes of drumsticks under his arm. And so we walk in and I greet each other at the door. Hey, we wanna, you know, and I said, what's that? And he goes, these, this is a Vader drumsticks. You need to find out about these guys. They're making amazing drumsticks. I've been with them since 1991. So that's how long it's been, wow. you know, and, and he, he always does that. I mean, he's, he really, um, I love to kid him, but he's just one of the most generous souls. Oh my find. God. Absolutely. The best. The best. I spent a lot of time with Dom uh, over the last couple of months just working on his technology stuff and um, having breakfast with him and Charmaine and the dogs. And, you know, it's been really, um, really great. I've known Dom a very long time. I did study with Dom as well. And um, but he is such a generous and kind and inspirational person, you know. He knows his business. He really does. He really does. One hundred percent. Yeah. Talk about the history and and what Gladstone brought and what Moeller brought. Oh I mean, he just knows the history of what's happening here. You know. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, TB player <laughs> said, and I always forget who TB player is. Uh -oh. So you have to put you have to type your name. But he he wrote yep. Klaus Hessler question mark, and then. I think referring to you. And then a few lines down, he wrote Ari Honig, question mark. And then a few lines down, he wrote Eddie Marshall, question mark. So um, that's a diverse group of, of people right there. Yeah, yeah. So you know, Klaus is kind of, uh, I, I don't know him as well. I, 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 I enjoy watching his, his social media stuff uh, a lot. And, you know, I like the way his mind is organized. Yeah. I like the way he thinks. I like the way he presents material. Um, you know, I've been doing this a long time and I've heard a lot of people talk about a lot of concepts and, you know, and it, when, when he came on the scene and, or I became aware of him, not when he came on the scene, but when I became aware of him and I started watching, I went, I hadn't thought of that, you know? Right. So I enjoy him. Um, He's going to be on the show um, in August. And we're going to do a special daytime edition because he's six hours ahead. So we're going to stream at one o'clock in the afternoon. Um, but I've studied with Klaus and um, and he's also, I mean, everybody knows he's a former student of Dom as well. And um, yeah, I love the way his thoughts are organized, but also he's such a wealth of history yeah. um, on yeah. especially rudimental concepts and, and um, you know, with... European rudiment, you know, he'll go through French rudimental drumming and Swiss rudimental drumming really has this incredible knowledge. So really interesting. And Ari Honig um, is just a beautiful musician. Yeah. I mean, just a great drummer with a, comp you know, I, you know, he's one of the people who has a voice and that's what you want to hear. Yeah. You want, you want to find and seek out not the drummers who do what all the other drummers do. I mean, there's something to be gained by that. 
there's there's a lot to be gained by that actually um and if you have a lot of time and you can practice well then fine you find a bunch of people who are doing the thing you want to learn how to do and you see how they all do that thing but in the end you know the 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 goal is that you have to practice your instrument like charlie parker said you practice your instrument and you learn everything you can about music and then you get in the bandstand and you forget about all that right and then you play your life and if it's not if it, if your life if you don't live it it's not going to come out of your horn and you know if you're not honest if you're not connected to your instrument and to me that's what i'm always thinking about and working on because with the downturn of gigs for that year you know i i i, I signed with pro logics um which is just they're, they're just great people and they make amazing practice pads i'm a practice pad junkie and i have tons of them you know um, i have all but, of them all of their I, well I, I owe them an unboxing of something they just sent me but um you know i i've spent more time on this practice pad during covid during lockdown my family would go to bed you know and and uh yeah you know and and i would just do this until whatever and then this is this is the um um all in one yeah, the all-in-one. Thank you very much. I can see um, the gray surface just under your hi hat. Yes, there you go. This one, yeah, yeah. It's the all-in-one. And there the, you go. The brush surface is awesome. The brush surface. So that's what I was going to say. It's like I'll sit and I'll practice on the pad, but then I'll throw the brush surface on, and I, it's downstairs actually right now. But I'll put on, you know, a Kenny Barron duo record, and I'll just sit and play just brushes, no hi hat, no nothing. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's great. So I've spent a lot of time on this. Um, you have to practice. You have to practice a lot. But then in the end, you, you have to forget what you practice and what do you hear? Right. What do you hear? How should I hold the stick? This teacher says I should hold the stick this way. This teacher says I should hold the stick that way. Okay, there are strengths and, and pros and cons to all these different techniques. But in the end, what does it sound like? Right. Because, right. you know... Uh, <laughs> My teacher had, uh, Tony Churchill, who I mentioned earlier, had, he said, listen, man, he says, you practice all these techniques and you master all these techniques. And it's expected that that's what you're going to do. But if you're on the bandstand, he had a way with words. He goes, but if you're on the bandstand and you got to put a stick in each nostril and go like this to get the sound you want, that's what you do. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like this, this flat ride over here. It's, you know, it's nice. But then if you dead stick it, I don't know what this sounds like on that mic. I mean, my... my no, you my, can hear it. You can hear the difference. If you're holding it like this, it's one sound. That's right. another sound. Now, I don't know what the name of this is, you know, besides calling it dead sticking. But that's how I want to get that sound. So... I love... um. You know, technique means technique means how you do what you do. It doesn't mean the right way to do it. It just means how do you do it. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's all there is. It's just how are you going to get that sound? Jojo Meyer uh, in his um, Secret Weapons 1 video, he, uh, he says, <laughs> if, if one guy throws a garbage pail out of a window this way and gets the sound he wants, then who's to say what's right or wrong, right? It's like, it. yeah. You know, I think the worst thing that could happen, we have so much information now and we have science and we have, I mean, I, you know, people have been writing books about tendons and ligaments, drum books, right. you know, musculature and skeletal systems. And they've been, this is not new information, but I don't think it's a good thing to fall into a school of something. I don't think it's a good idea to fall into, well, this is the way this has to be because it might deprive you of doing something else. It might deprive you of the sound that you want to do. Um, you know, in the end, you use all these techniques. I mean, people go, yeah, but well, Buddy did that, man. Buddy did everything. <laughs> yeah, you know, he did. I don't like Buddy. And, and I, I've said this in magazines. I, it's kind of an old quote of mine, but I, I say it because it always seems to apply. I saw a, a Picasso exhibit at, at MoMA. And it was a retrospective of his earliest stuff to right before he passed away. And it was his entire life's work, examples of all these different materials and all these different, you know, uh, whatever. Um, the sculpture and, and paper mache and charcoal drawing and, and oils and everything else. It all looked like him. It all looked like him. 
So the technique of pointillism, the technique of charcoal on, on paper, the technique of paper mache is a technique. But in the end, everything he touched, every technique he used, he made his own. That's what you want to be doing here. Right. That's what you want to be doing. You want to be learning techniques to get to what it is you want to say. Coltrane practiced incessantly because he wanted to play what he was trying to play, not to be the fastest saxophone player. That was never the goal. Right. So you know, if you're practicing to get fast, where are you going to go fast? What's your intention? What, what do you, where do you plan to use fast? Um, I was on a gig once with a great trumpet player here in New York who's, I've been on symphony uh, 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 session dates with him, you know, film dates and club dates and jazz gigs. I've done all kinds of work with him. He's a master of the trumpet. And we were on a gig once and then the sound man was, a, you know, kind of a trumpet aficionado. And, and he said, hey man, you know, can you play like Maynard? Can you play like Maynard? And he said, I don't really hear that. You know, he didn't put it down. Maynard's a right. great trumpet player. But he said, That's, that doesn't have anything to do with how I want to play. Right. So when you talk about technique, obviously, you know, if you're just learning how to hold the sticks, you've got a, you've got a ways to go. You have a lot to learn. You've got to learn how to make this work. And you have a lot to learn. You know, you've got a lot of homework to do, and it's going to be fun, and it's going to be incredibly rewarding. And like I said, you got all this other material. But in the end, what is it you want to do with these sticks? What do you want to... What do you want to say? You know, I mean, we don't, I, I, I'm glad to hear um, some of these analogies now about language being yeah. used more often mm -hmm. and DNA, which, you know, some of us have been using for decades, but now it's kind of becoming common thinking. It's like, you're not thinking verb, uh, pronoun, pronoun, verb, question right. mark. You know, I mean, that's technique. Technique is question mark. You know, that's what that is. But it's not what you want to say. Man, I right. love how you play drums. I love how you play the drum. That's what you want to convey. Sorry, and I shouldn't it, have called. And the biggest compliment you can get is when somebody says, when I hear you you playing like on a recording or something, they're like, I, I can tell it's you. You know, like they hear the individuality. This whole thing started with the Ari Honig question, you know, because yeah. it's like Ari doesn't sound like anybody. Yeah. One sounds like him. Because if you do what he does, you go, oh, you're doing the Ari Honig thing. Oh, cool. You know, <laughs> it's like you can't sound like him and he doesn't sound like anybody else. No. And there are great drummers who play that way now. You know, I mean, uh, the, the, that's what you want to gravitate to. Ultimately, you want to listen to the people that have their own voices. The, I had such a huge lesson when I was, uh, I, again, I've told this story a lot. So if you've heard it before, Forgive me. Go get, go get a glass of milk. Um, but but um, I, I had a very beautiful experience when I was a kid. I, I had been playing a gig, and uh, George Simon, who was a, a drummer, but he was also a writer a, a, from the swing era, a Metronome magazine, and he wrote this big swing books. He was a great jazz writer, um, and he was involved with the Jackie Robinson Foundation. And he heard me play and he said, man, I, I want to get you involved in what we're doing. And they were doing something at the Robinson home called an afternoon of jazz. And it was a fundraiser for the Jackie Robinson foundation. It was done at Rachel Robinson's home. Um, and it was an amazing experience. It was just the most amazing experience because I'm some kid and I got very lucky and lucked into this gig, but all these superstar jazz musicians were there. I mean, you name it, they were all there. Dizzy Gillespie and Grover Washington and Dave Brubeck and it didn't matter. They were all there. They all came through. But one particular, Max was there a lot. And so I got to see him and know him and talk to him quite a bit. But Buddy showed up one day, same day Max was on the bill. And Max was, was playing, but, but Buddy, uh, we're, we used to hang in the house, that, in Rachel's house. That was our green room. They'd have food and all these musicians. And I'm looking around and going like, there's Jerry Mulligan, there's McCoy Tyner. It's like, oh my God. Um, and, and, but I saw Buddy and I was so excited. I, was like, I had to go talk to him. And I said, uh, hey, uh, Mr. Rich, I'm you know, really glad to see you here. Uh, are you going to play today? And he said, no, nah, man, uh, you know, I just, uh, I got rained out last night. We were supposed to do an outdoor thing and I heard this was happening. So I just came by, I had a day to kill. So, uh, you know. And I went, oh, well, okay, that's too bad. Well, okay, great to meet you, Mr. Rich. Thank you. Yeah, okay. And, and that was it. You know, he was really very, very kind to me. Um, 
And then I left, I left and I went down, you walk down this long hill to get to the base of the hill where the tent was set up with the stage and all that stuff. And I was supposed to play. And then I played a little bit. And then they announced Dizzy Gillespie. And Dizzy, and I knew Dizzy was on the bill, but Dizzy, ladies and gentlemen, Dizzy Gillespie. And Dizzy comes down the hill and he is literally dragging Buddy <laughs> by the hand. And Buddy's going, man, I told you I'm not going to play. And he's going, come on, you're playing with me. And he did. Now, there were two drum sets. There was my drum set, which was actually a exact replica of this. Uh, man, I miss those drums. But anyway, um, this, but, but earlier drums. And then, but they're small drums, 12, 14, 18. And then uh, Joe Corsello had a kit, which was a Pearl drum set, um, which were 12, 13, 16, and a 22-inch bass drum. So Buddy looked and he went, uh, I'll take those pearl drums, but give me that Gret snare drum. So he played my snare drum and my wow. cymbals. Yeah. And he used my sticks. He wasn't supposed to be there, so he didn't have anything at all. Now, he sat down at my snare drum, and I played with Diz he played with Dizzy, and it was his snare drum. It was no longer mine. It was him, right? It was amazing to me how that could happen. But then... He leaves, and Max comes over, and Max has a little, a little, uh, little travel bag, and it's got his Ludwig bass drum pedal in it, uh, his Speed King, and a pair of sticks. That's all that was in it. And he sits down at my drums, and he sits down and goes, you know, battle, um, but it go. And he did Mr. Hi Hat on my hi hat, and I'm stunned. I'm going, this snare drum. Neither one of them took a key to this drum, and yet they sound like themselves on my drum. And a bunch of other people played that drum that day. And that was, that was such a huge experience, learning experience, because I thought it has nothing to do with anything other than what you hear and what you make come out. Right. How you tune the instruments, the symbols you choose, it's, it's what you hear. It's how you touch it, how you, know, how you play it, what you bring out of it. You know, I, I love that story. That's the second time I've heard that story. I'm and sorry I, if I've twice. No, no, it's just no. a, I love that story. And and that's such an important lesson, especially for the young like kids that are listening, because Absolutely. it's about what's in here and what's in here and what's in here. <laughs> that's it. It, you know, it, it. You make the drums do what you want them to do. You find your sound. Like Art Blakey said, you should be able to get your sound out of anything. And these guys would sit down at these drums and they would sound like themselves. They didn't change anything. When, when they, had a, um, they had a memorial for John Abercrombie a couple of years ago yeah. and uh, Peter Erskine and Billy Hart and Adam Nussbaum and Joey Barron and Jack, and I hope I'm not forgetting anybody, but those are five very powerful drummers. All came out, all played the exact same drum set, the exact same cymbals. No one touched anything. No one moved anything. Ladies and gentlemen, Jack DeJeanette came down, sit down. Every single one of them sounded like every single record of theirs you have ever heard. Right. Explain. But the thing is, piano players do this all the time. You hear Chick play a piano, and then Herbie play the same piano, and Count Basie play the same piano, and they don't sound the same. Right. So, you know, this is what you have to be going for. What are you hearing? You want to learn how to tune drums? What is it you want to hear? You want to learn how to hit a cymbal correctly? What is it you want to get out of that symbol? You know, this gets one sound, this gets another sound. You know, uh, be, be listening to music and listening to the best drummers you can find and how to pull what you want out of it. I want to get a little bit of that. I want to get a little bit of this out of that. Um, yeah. I'm very talkative tonight. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't apologize. It's awesome. By the way, um, my mom's in here. So my mom says, hi, Jim and Jim. Um, hi, Mrs. Are you <laughs> and Dave Starks hanging with us? Dave, what's Dave. up, buddy? Dave. Yeah, yeah, we got to get Dave on this show one of these days. Amazing, um, he's apologizing for being late. Better late than never. You're here. He, he called here. you old, by the way. I don't, I think that was I meant am. for you. I am, I am, I know. <laughs> oh, and, I, and I guess he's going back to Frankie Malabe. He studied with Frankie. Oh, uh, yeah, Brian Delaney's in the house. Good stuff, Jim. Brian. Jim, okay, stop right now. <laughs> if you know Brian Delaney, then you know what I'm going to say. If you don't know Brian Delaney, I'm going to tell you Brian Delaney has some of the best time of any drummer I have ever heard. Period. Done. That's it. If you don't know who Brian Delaney is, find him. Find him on a record. Find him on YouTube. Find him on someplace. His backbeat, it doesn't matter what he's playing. He can be playing something big and loud. He can be playing some swing or something. 
just his innate sense of time is so beautiful. I've been able to sing a lot with him playing drums. This oh. is why I know. And, uh, and that's been a great thing about playing, about singing in the New York area for all these years. I mean, the list of drummers that I've gotten to play with, you know, beyond bandstand with Paul Wells and, uh, oh my God, I, I can't even think of any, Joe Bonadio and um, uh, Jimmy Vallis, who a lot of people don't know about, but he was uh, one of the, um, um, oh, the Westchester drum teacher that everyone, that Dave Wecklin everyone studied with, wrote the book, I'm forgetting his name. Oh, you're talking about Gary Chester? Gary Chester, yeah, he was one yeah. of Gary Chester's racers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a lot of great drummers, but Brian is just his time is just beautiful, really an amazing thing. So you should you should listen to that. You heard it here, people. Brian Delaney. Right, Brian Delaney. Dave Stark just said we're all old. <laughs> um, that's pretty funny. Uh, yeah. So um, you know, I I wanted to ask you about uh about your playing, and kind of your start because um. Everybody, and I always ask everybody, like, how did it start for you? And everybody's answers are always different, but there's always this common thread for us where it was, you know, like for uh, Lib DeVito, it was, you know, Ringo, you know, like everybody has somebody that, that started the fire, right? So, but the initial spark before you turned serious, so what was the first, like, what made you go, oh, I want to play drums? Um, I, I I come from a family of musicians, so um, maybe later I'll post it in the chat. There's a great picture of my grandmother playing bass. Oh, really? Um, yeah, she played upright, and uh, and she uh, she did gigs. She had all of her brothers played played instruments, and they all they had a band, and they played they played gigs on like a lot. She worked a lot. Um, and she played upright until they were on vacation in Florida, and uh, my grandfather saw an electric bass, a violin, like a Paul McCartney, but it was a Gibson violin body bass in the music store. And he said, I'm buying that because I'm tired of carrying that big thing around for you. So he bought her a bass. Um, Is this Grandma Tricks? How did you know that? Yes. yes I know everything. <laughs> I do my research. Oh, God, you really do. Yes. And I only have three stories, and I tell them everywhere I go. So I may have said this before, too. Um, she gave you your first ukulele, right? I can't believe you said it. Yes, she <laughs> gave me my first ukulele. She did. Um, she and, and she also, uh, she was just a huge influence. She, she introduced me to, uh, she always had records on at her house. So I heard Jean Krupa. Uh, at her house. I heard Sing 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 at her house. And she had a bass in the corner. It's funny, when the guys were here playing the other day, I told them this, and they, they were they just couldn't believe it. She, the, her upright was in the corner, and I said, Graham, play me a song. I was little. I said, Graham, play me a song. I Take that thing and play me a song. And she said, well, honey, she's, you know, bass is an accompaniment instrument. You don't really, you know, it's not, you don't play songs on it. And I said, but just do something. And she went, oh, okay. And she strummed a chord, and she went, bloom. My heart is sad and lonely. And she sang body and soul and played chords on the upright bass. Oh and I think God. about that now, and it kills me. <laughs> it's just like, wow. but this was my grandmother. So, I, I mean, I've been around this kind of you know, musician and musical people thinking like this a long time. And that family, uh, my mother's side, always had jam sessions. So just for fun, they would get together and play music. That's what they did. And so I got on the drums very early. I remember the guy, uh, I remember the drum set. Um, I have a picture of it somewhere. Um, and then my mother was always listening to music in the house. And, you know, I annoy my kids because I constantly have music on. And it's like, do you ever have silence? No, I don't. <laughs> um, so there were a couple of records that, that just... <laughs> drew me in um and the one that really made the biggest impact was a record called dinah jams it was dinah washington uh with max roach's group with clifford brown and wow. uh, richie powell and george morrow and then it was it was expanded actually with clark terry and uh maynard ferguson speaking of which and um herb geller saxophone player and so it was like a five horn thing um and that that was the one that I, I kind of, the drums were all I heard. 
And I actually have the speaker that my mother had in the house. It's here in my house. Um, and it was just a single speaker, and I used to sit with my ear pressed up against it, and I would listen to that. And it was a live record, and people were clapping, so it felt like I was in the room. And that was, um, that was my first real experience of hearing drums like that. And I remember thinking and not knowing, like I'm hearing trumpet players going, and then I'm listening to Max going, and it all sounded like one continuous legato line. So I didn't realize that it was single strokes and double strokes. I didn't know anything about that, but that, that's how I heard drums for a long time. So that was the record. And then um, I have two sisters who are uh, uh, older than me. <laughs> if you're watching, you're really old. Um, <laughs> but they're, um, but yeah. So and they, you know, they were they were listening to two things almost exclusively. Um, you know, the Beatles and British pop and American pop and Motown. Right. So that was always on in my house. So those three things, you know, it was it was Sinatra and Basie and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan and Ella Fitzgerald, and then the Beatles and Motown and the Stones. Not so much the Stones, but 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 some Stones and and all the pop music that was happening back then. Um, and it was just there was never a question. I mean, that the drums was it, and there was never a question that that's what I was going to do. I didn't think twice about it. It was just okay. You know, how do I learn to play the drums? And and it kind of went from there. And um, I know the Beatles were were an, an influence, you know. And um, and I know that you played, you sang, <laughs> on a, the complete Beatles on ukulele album. Is you it? do homework. <laughs> so Stefo does homework. Yes, yes. I I did a track. Um. So so a guy. Lovely uh, Rita. Lovely Rita. I did lovely Rita. Um. A guy came to me at a gig one night. Um, I, so there's a great drummer in New York. If you don't know him, you should. His name is Graham Hawthorne. And uh, Graham followed Steve Gadd into Paul Simon's band. And he's had a really long, successful studio career. And right now, he actually just sent me some mixes of a record that he has that I'm singing on. Um, he's got a new record coming out with this band that he's had together for about 10 years or so. Um, um, but anyway, we were, we were doing some gigs at that time. We, the band was kind of new. We were doing a bunch of gigs. And it, 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 it was a little scene for a while. Like a lot of people were coming to the gigs and packing these small places. Um, and so everybody knew us and we knew everybody. But it was always just a, a great hang, you know, like the audiences were great. And everyone knew what we were up to. Um, and a guy came up to me one night and he said, I understand you play ukulele. I'm going, where are people getting this information? Um, <laughs> but, but he said, I understand you play ukulele. He said, I'm making this record and it's called The Complete Beatles on Ukulele. He goes, and you know, a bunch of, he named a bunch of musicians who I knew and a bunch of musicians who I didn't know. And he said, and Cynthia Lennon's doing a track and Deepak Chopra's doing a track. Um, would you do a track? And I said, well, yeah. And I started to think what song I wanted to do. He goes, well, there's only one song left. <laughs> <laughs> so you're and stuck with it, buddy. I'm, yeah, and it's lovely Rita. And I went, well, then that's the one I'm going to do. Um, and, you know, um, it's funny. It'll pop up once in a while in iTunes shuffling around, you know. And I'll listen to it with, with an objective ear. And sometimes I love it and it's fun. And sometimes I just I hate it because I remember the flop sweat, you know, of, of like, you know, all the, I, I played drums on it. I recorded the drums in Nashville at Wes Little. Do you know Wes? No. Wes is another unsung cat, man. I mean, Wes is, is extremely busy in Nashville, but he's he's from here. He's a very dear friend. Um, and uh, so he has a, a studio in Nashville. I was at Nashville for the summer NAM or something. Um, and I went to his house and said, I got this thing to do. And we recorded the drums at his place. So the drum sounds great. The drums um, sound really good. I heard the track. Oh, you to it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 So, so he, you know, he, he did a great, he did a great job on that. Uh, but he gets great drum sounds. I mean, he's doing a lot of work from his own studio and right. he, he's very busy anyway. Um, and then I had a, a great bass player, good, good friend of mine named Mike Hall who's just like a fixture here in the New York area on bass. He's just everywhere all the time. He played bass, big Beatle fan. Um, and Paul Levant, uh, who's a, an amazing guitar player and just one of the best musicians I've ever known. Um, he came here and he played uh, guitar 
and he was wide open for just anything. He got it right away, and he was wide open. Um, excuse me. And um, and then he also played uh, the 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 little ukulele solo in the middle is actually him playing acoustic guitar. All right, my boys just came home from dinner. Hi guys. <laughs> hey um, guys. Yeah. So uh, the things are on their way upstairs. That was a very quiet entrance, and wow. Very. <laughs> You must want to bump in their allowance or something. Um, so I had some really great musicians on it. And, and I had this idea um, where I wanted to kind of mash up some stuff. So the beginning is uh, uh, Thank You Girl. Uh, just the little harmonica intro from Thank You Girl. And then the groove underneath it is that comes and goes a couple times is um, from Tomorrow Never Knows. And then I did the song Pretty Straight, you know, in the middle. Um, but the thing was... The vocal was the last thing I focused on. It should have been something I was very focused on, and it was like the last thing I focused on. Well, I thought the so, vocal was great. Well, thank you. Um, there's one on a defunct on a on a broken hard drive that's really good, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it it gets by. It was, it's a fun thing. And then there's this little vamp at the end that kind of. If you're a Beatle fan, I'll tell you what. If you're a Beatle fan, um, listen to that. Listen to that and see how many Beatle references that have nothing to do with Lovely Rita you can pick out because there's like mm. 25 of them wow yeah uh there are little melodic quotes and oral cues and at one point there's a ringo laugh in there remember the cartoon the big the ringo cart the beatles cartoon yeah every time ringo laughed he went huh? yeah. <laughs> that was, so that's in there well that's uh, that is a lot of thought being put into it for sure well yeah <clears> yeah <throat> it was a fun it was a fun project it yeah. was by the way, Jim Royal's in the house. <laughs> Jim Royal, former Connecticut, uh, longtime Connecticut PAS chapter president, great drummer. And if you don't know about what Jim does, check him out because he's got this whole his pan uh, thing is crazy. Just he he is someone who has taken what we do, you know, this whole education thing and getting kids involved in, in playing and playing music and really having it, you know, with the same discipline that like maybe, you know, you see kids getting into sports this way, but music right. was like, maybe they did. Jim has this great program in Connecticut and it's big. I think it's, it's pretty big now. Yeah. The Jim uh, Royal drum school. Jim Royal drum school. Check. Yeah. If yeah, you're yeah, in Connecticut. Really cool. Really cool. Fairfield. I think he's in Fairfield. Yeah. Old friend of mine. Yeah, yeah, he's a good guy. He um he was really generous with his time and did a little a little promo about my book that I didn't solicit. He just did it on his own. Such a sweetheart. Your book is great. The drum fill book is great. Oh, thanks, man. And the amount of time you put into that and transcribing a lot of those fills because that's a lot. A lot of what's in that book is stuff that I grew up on. And I'm going, yeah, but did he get? Man, he nailed that one too. Oh, did he get... <laughs> that was a labor of love for sure. I believe you. So um, I have to ask, uh, so as a fellow New Yorker, yeah, off topic, and by the way, Janine said that she loves your pizza posts. Um, you got to, you have to come, everyone has to come to my pizza place. It's not my personal pizza place, but it's where I go. It's just So I was going to ask you, as a New Yorker, what is your spot for pizza? Okay. It's a place in Bay Ridge and it's called Lombardo's of Bay Ridge. Oh yeah. I know about it. <laughs> yes. It's, it's too good. It's Wait, too good. is Lombardo's on um Third Avenue? Oh, it's off it's on seventy first off third. Yeah, seventy first off third. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yep. Last night. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. It, it's ridiculously good. Yeah. Bar I got a little picture of that. What's that? I said, Oh, let me get a picture of that pizza. It's like no <laughs> yeah, one exactly. Pizza, but... Um Bart Robley's here. He's saying great show, guys. Um Okay, now I have a question for you. I'm gonna, I'll go first, and then you're gonna go. So, most embarrassing moment oh. on a gig. So, check this out. I, I was playing the Paramount, and it was like, um, it was a fundraiser, and it was like all these different cabaret singers: Blythe Danner and um, uh, Lucy Ernest Jr. Oh, yeah. was on the I bill, know. and so like, um. In her chart, so we just had a read down like 10 minutes, you know, earlier in the day. We just read down the chart real quick, just kind of went over some points with the musical director. And um, and in, in Lucy Arnaz's um, arrangement, there's a part where it just says, 
wipeout in big letters, exclamation point, and it's just a bracket for drums, and she's going to dance. So showtime, playing at the gig, and um, the only thing I could think of in the moment was Sing, Sing, Sing. So I was playing a swung version of Wipeout, and it kind of works if you think about it, right? So you come from so that's what I played. Similar melody. What's that? It was similar rhythmic melody. Right, similar rhythmic melody. So I played Sing 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 instead of Wipeout. So. And I don't think she mi- she didn't miss a beat. She just was dancing. I don't. She probably didn't even notice. Musical director definitely noticed. Looked over like, okay. <laughs> so yeah, that was embarrassing. Go. <laughs> My most embarrassing story on a gig. Well, I've been doing this, you know. Uh, uh, uh. My my first gig, I think, was uh, George Washington's inaugural gala. So. Uh, <laughs> I've had a lot of gigs. I've had a lot of opportunities to uh, embarrass myself. <laughs> but the one that has always stuck out the biggest, and I, I've, I tell this story in clinics about context and about playing with musicians and being a part of the conversation that is happening in that moment. And this is why I offer this story up to, you know, to students, because um, it was stupid embarrassing. It was, like, really bad. Um, I was... When I was, uh, I, I started playing gigs on my 13th birthday. And by the time I was 15, I was working six nights a week. I was working all the time. I look at my date books, you know, up until I'm 25. And I, I can't, I, it's like, what did I do with all that money? Um, <laughs> Boy, I mean, it was, seriously. Yeah, I, I did a lot. Um, anyway, so I was, I was, all I did was play drums. I mean, it was like, it was my entire life. And uh, I, I was in this band with this guy, and um, he was not, the band leader was not popular with the band. He, he didn't treat us well. He didn't pay us well. Um, and he was kind of, he was all about himself and, you know, it was kind of a vanity band kind of thing. Um, this is not the most embarrassing part, but, but <laughs> how the band got even with him was that uh, they were all really great musicians. So Friday night, if we had five gigs in a weekend, Friday night, they would start, whatever whatever songs we were playing, they would do down a minor third. And everything would go up a half step over the weekend so that by Sunday afternoon or Sunday night, he's up a minor or major third from where he's supposed to be. And he would start out, he would start out Friday night going, and now the end is near. And he couldn't hit. And then Sunday night, he's going, and did it! Oh my god! <laughs> they were brutal to this cat. They hated him, um, oh but he, but but he sticks out in my mind because here's what he did. So and it was my own fault. I had it coming. In addition to doing all these gigs and playing all these, you know, gigs, I was uh, eating and sleeping and memorizing drums. And there was a Buddy Rich record you, a lot of you may know called uh, Rich in London. You know that record. And it's famous because it's the one where Bud Slingerland saw the five snare drum on his, you know, on the cover and got mad. Anyway, there's a solo on the song called Time Being on that record. It's like a 12 or 13 minute Bill Holman chart and it's magnificent. And it goes through all these different shifting colors. And it's, you know, and and before the solo, it's really just raising intention and color and dynamics and everything. And the the band is, that's it leaves Buddy here like at three f's and he goes and instead of keeping the 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 volume there buddy comes down to a press roll a pianissimo press roll right and it was the coolest thing i'd ever heard and he starts his solo as a press roll and do some accents in the press roll and then he starts moving around the drums and of course five minutes later when the solo is over he is right back up at this level and then when he counts the band back in and they're right where they left off well this to me was just a mesmerizing thing that that they had done so when it i used to get a solo i used to get a solo in like proud mary or whatever song they give the drum solo in right so i'm you know i'm playing and there's like five thousand people on the dance band dance dance floor and i break down and press press 
<laughs> I'm playing this pianissimo, you know. Just like Buddy, just like Buddy. This part I had down, I knew it. And I, I knew for a fact that five minutes from now, when I played the rest of the solo, these people were going to be chanting my name. I knew oh, yes. this. Of course. This, this was guaranteed. And someone was going to have to collect the $20 bills that they had thrown on the dance, bandstand for me. I, this, 100%. I, this, my, this was, yes. Pat Metheny was the next step after this. I knew that. I was 15. I was ready to go. And um, so I have my head down, and I'm beginning this this incredible event and the singer on the microphone says don't look at me i don't know what the hell he's doing <laughs> oh my and, god and what occurred to me and i didn't realize is that everyone had stopped dancing and they're all just kind of staring and there's a teenager playing a press roll on a snare drum in the middle of a, of a gig <laughs> and no one knew why and i didn't know why even but i knew it was going to be great and when he did that uh, uh, my perspective changed and i was mortified i was absolutely and immediately i just went <laughs> and i passed as loud as i could and i counted the band in um but the lesson that i learned much as i hated him for doing that to me uh to save his own skin uh the, the lesson that i learned was just you know i couldn't put a price on it <laughs> that's one of those not on my gig that exactly nice. see that's the thing if I did that, if I did that on social media, someone would go, "Man, that's great!" Yeah. You know, <laughs> the band leader went, "No, no, no, not here. No way." High five. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh my god. So, um, yeah, that that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, it was humiliating. That's perspective, right? Many more, but that was <laughs> that was pretty humiliating. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's great. You know, these these are memories and experience of playing gigs very young. Um, I, I've talked about it on the, on the show a few times, but my first gig was in a nursing home. I think I was 12, um, Chet Tabo, um, my good buddy was doing sound for us cause his nephews were in the band and we were playing at a nursing home and playing TV show themes like the Pink Panther and MASH. <laughs> like, um, we played some Billy Joel, you know, we played all the hits for the, uh, for the nursing home community. Um, but what a great way to get your feet wet and, and get started, you know. So for, for these young kids, what you were saying before about that they're, you know, they're making videos, they're putting up content, but they're not really playing with people. And it's sort of, you know, my first band after those those couple of gigs when I was a little kid in, you know, sixth grade, we put together a band and we stayed together through junior high and we played gigs and we played at Brooklyn College and we did, you know, all these different things and, it was building that repertoire and that communication between musicians that these kids seemingly don't have right now. It, it's just, it's an important thing and it is missing. It's a, it's, it's missing in their playing. And I, you know, obviously the young ones may gravitate to that. Yeah. Um, and the ones that get scooped up into bands, you know, then they're going to be okay. Yeah. Um, the, the problem is, you know, th there's always been a sport aspect to the drums you know there's always been someone who said who's the fastest drummer or who's you know whose single strokes are amazing i mean people argued that way about buddy and gene krupa a thousand years ago so this idea of you know technique or you know just being a facility right. the, the specter of facility you know this is not new there's always been someone who's had tremendous facility um but if you really want to have the the best experience you can playing this instrument or any instrument, but, but it really has to transcend that, right. you know, it, it has to be, go beyond sport and become art. And, you know, sport is fun. I love sports. I mean, I, you know, I, I was screaming at the TV yesterday when Italy won the match, you know, <laughs> right. um, you know, but, but, but this has to be something about something else because like I said earlier, earlier, we're in this Renaissance of equipment making, right? I mean, you know, I've been, I've been with Sabian for, 30 years right and they are killing it they just oh are making God. so many great symbols so much great stuff but how do you go around about selecting your symbol 
you know, what, what, what's, your, what's your criteria for what's a good symbol? Well, the one I heard that guy play or that girl play or that kid play or that older guy play or whoever, whoever I heard that person play on Instagram that they had a dry crash, so I'm going to get a dry crash. Well, what happens when you get on a bandstand with a bunch of musicians and that dry crash isn't the right crash, right? Right. Now, now you have to make a different decision because you're in a different, you're in a musical situation. So that's, that's the thing, you know, if you're always bringing what you do into music, it will tell you what has to happen next. If you're playing with great musicians, and you should always try and play with musicians who are better than you. That's just a given. Definitely. Great musicians are going to lift you up. Freddie Waits told me that many, many years ago. I was maybe 19 and went, excuse me, went to study with him. And he's, I played him a tape that I had made with some friends of mine, you know, and he said, you know, you play good you play good and you know, you, you, you'll, you'll do well. Um, but you need to play with musicians who are older than you and better than you. And that's, they're going to lift you up and they're going to, you know, have a short fuse for what you should and shouldn't do and when you should and shouldn't do it. Right. Um, because Steve Gadd, I, I, you know, I repeat myself a lot just because these things are, they work, you know what I mean? In, 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 in impressing these ideas on students and people who are new to this kind of thinking, Steve Gadd, I can, it's just one of the most beautiful drummers that we've ever seen, right? I mean, who, who could ever doubt that? But Steve Gadd is not on 5,000 records because of his flammacues. <laughs> that is correct. On 5,000 records because he knew what to play and when to play it. And yep. even, I remember being in high school and there was a Carly Simon record that came out and he was on all the tracks but he wasn't on one. And then I saw an article or some, maybe it was on the liner notes, but it just said that he, you know, he walked in and he went, I'm not hearing any drums on this. Like they said, Steve, what do you want to play? And he goes, ah, nothing, <laughs> nothing. It doesn't need me. That, that's thinking about the music, right. you know. You listen to Jimmy Cobb and Jimmy Cobb is just playing quarter notes on the ride cymbal. You know, there's no, blah, 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 blah. I mean, Jimmy, Jimmy loved to play. When, when he came to Sabian, I actually was involved in getting him to come to Sabian. And we, uh, uh, Paulie brought down a bunch of cymbals to Michiko in, in, in Midtown. And, you know, we had lunch and then we went up and he was picking cymbals. And his wife, Elena, said to me, she goes, oh, my God, this, he's, look how happy he is. He's, I mean, he's doing all of his stuff. He's, he's playing and he's, you know, and he's checking out the cymbals, but then he's soloing and then he's listening to what they sound like in this context and cutting in this way. It was, it was all drums. But then you go see him at the gig that night and it's yep. quiet, this, yep. you know. Knowing I mean, what not to play. <laughs> you want to play. Miles said it a thousand times. You know, it's just like what you don't play is what matters. Right. You know, Graham Hawthorne has a great line about this kind of, you know, this is a five and this is a seven. I'm doing nine against 15. And um, I'm joking, of course, and making light of it. But, but Graham said a groove is not born on a slide rule. A groove has to make people move. It has to make people dance. And, you know, all of our great American music, whether it's Motown, whether it's, you know, big band jazz, smoke, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, it almost always involved dancers. It involved communicating with people. And if you play for dancers, really great dancers, they don't take any mess. <laughs> yeah. If you're not happening, they're going to go, eh, you know, you know, um, and, and great dancers, as soon as they hear the count off that the time is happening, they start dancing. They don't, it could be an intro. They don't know what song it is. They don't care. If the time is happening, then they're going to dance. So you're going to make people, you know, you're going to, you're going to make them want to move to it. So, I mean, it's just, it's a really important thing and it's so much fun. I mean, it is, it's just so much fun to get caught up in everything, you know, and want to do, you know, everything. And that's all fun. It's tremendous fun, but taste. Great music is about taste and application. You know, Gad can do I mean, we, we, we all try and want, want to learn how to do what Gad can do. We know he can do it, but he's not doing it all the time. You know, it's just. Right. So I, I, I don't think there's any more important thing for young drummers to learn right now or just anyone starting out. You know, it's just like. And if I, young yeah. people <laughs> go see all of these people play while we still have them. Go see them. Yeah, go I mean, see we, them. I know we're just coming out of a pandemic, but as the music comes back, go, go, go. You don't want to get to a point in your life where you said, "Man, 
I had an opportunity to see so and so. I didn't go. I should have done it. You know. You know, if you look back at at some of the great musicians, with some of the motivators of American music are still here. Now we're starting to lose them. Know. You know, but but we still have quite a few of them. I mean, you know, Ringo's eighty and Paul McCartney is eighty or whatever they are. Ringo just you had know. his birthday, right? Who just had his birthday. I mean, James Taylor, um, you know, is touring. James Taylor is just, a st if I could play guitar, it would be hard for me to decide if I wanted to play like James Taylor or Jim Hall. Like, I, I, I would be a hard decision to have to make. But he's I just. I love James Taylor. Oh, I Dying mean. Fan. You know, and always no, a great drummer in the seat, of course. Always a great drummer in the seat. That Carlo, Carlos Vega on that live record. Oh. It, I, you want to learn how to play drums and what to play on drums and how to make music feel great. Listen to James Taylor live and listen to Carlos Vega. I love the story that Jeff Procaro called Carlos one day and said, man, you, what are you doing right now? He goes, Nothing. He goes, get over here right now. you got to hear this. And he goes to his head. You know the story? And he goes to, to Jeff's house and he sits down. And he goes, this drummer is killing me. Listen to this record. And he puts it on and it's Carlos. And, and he goes, that's me. He goes, I know. This is amazing. <laughs> and Carlos starts to cry because Procaro is just like, I mean, but that's what it's about. You know, I mean, uh, what's the... Um, Oh. Steely Dan, um, first when I think, boy, you can't miss, you got something that, um, anyway, oh, it's just can't... making music feel great. I'm sorry. It's just making music feel great. We right. have so many great, uh, so many great examples of people that make music feel great. S practice 20 hours a day, but when you get with musicians, listen to the space between the beats, listen to the space between the notes. That's where the life is. It's not in what you play, it's what you don't play. It's the, it, like Adam said to me when I was a kid, you know, and I said, man, I'm, I'm going to be playing with a, it was a well-known bass player, jazz bass player. And he, I, I said, you know, is he good? Like, you know, what should I expect? And he goes, man, he's good. He's got a lot of air in his time, man. <laughs> what does that mean? You know, instead of dum 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 dum, you know, he's got. I mean, he's got life in his time. Yeah. That's what Adam was listening for. That makes your life on a bandstand four of the best hours you could ever ask for. And when it's not happening, it's like pulling a Mack truck behind you, no matter how much chops you right. have. So, I mean, you know, I, I just think the balance needs to come back. I know I'm I'm beating a dead horse here. <laughs> I, I'll say, man, you know, just two things. And Brian Delaney just said that he listens to that James Taylor record almost daily. Yeah. Um, I got to see on several occasions, but the band when Don Grolnick was in oh. the band, and it was Don Grolnick and Carlos Vega, Jimmy Johnson was on bass. And seeing that band live with James Taylor was unbelievable and, and just would, you know, make you weep. <laughs> just listening to what they were playing because it was so beautiful. Absolutely. And that's what music's supposed to do. I mean, you know, it, 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 at the end of my days, I, all right, I'm going to have a really corny moment like I had earlier, but it, it's just, it's true. And I, I, I have to say it. If I don't say it publicly, I'll be afraid to admit it. I, I, I have spent so much time on this practice pad, you know, feeling loose and feeling limber but in the end of my days what i want is i want to play time on a ride cymbal that makes someone in the audience turn to the person they're with and go you know wow i really love this person i really do you know i want to take them someplace aside from did you see what he did did you see what that drummer did right you know i mean and and, and again if, if you've heard me say this before forgive me um but when i hear people who have an overwhelming amount of, t of facility on the instrument. It doesn't turn me off. I get excited. I kind of go, it's amazing to me what the human body can do. It's amazing to me what the drums are capable of. It's amazing to me that that person took what that last person had and brought it to another level. And it's just incredible to me that they can do that. When I hear Steve Gadd play with whoever, Chick at the Blue Note or Paul Simon, or I've seen him in so many different situations. I've seen him with James. You know, I'm thinking about, oh, look at his hands move. Just look at how beautifully his hands flow around the drums. And then I stop thinking about that. 
and I'm listening to his time, and I'm right. listening to the space between everything he touches and how every sound contributes to the time, every sound and every idea contributes to the wholeness of the band. And then I start thinking about the history of like American pop music, and you know what I mean? And I'm someplace else. I'm not thinking about his hands or his signature snare drum anymore. And when I would sit for weeks at a time, which I did, when I'd sit and listen to Elvin, I would watch his hands and I go, that's how he holds that? That's how he's hitting? And I was all about the, the how and I was all about the motion and the, you know, and watching him do that and the way he held the brushes, which killed me. And then within minutes, I'm thinking, so, so, wait a second. So you mean like the, the, the rings of Saturn, they're not solid, right? They're like particles and they're actually, I'm someplace else. I'm completely transported by him and by all of the music and by all of the musicians, because that's what they're listening to. Those musicians that are playing music on that level are not thinking about the technique any more than you're thinking about verbs and vowels and consonants when you speak. It's the idea that matters. And they're all listening on this incredibly high level. And this is what musicians need to learn to do, is to listen to each other and complement what's happening. You know, if you're in a trio, or whatever size the band is, but if you're in a trio, and if you're improvising especially, you're playing your ideas and you're responding to what the piano player plays. And you're putting the time on the cymbal and you're playing with the bass player and the bass player is playing the changes along with the substitutions and adding what they think makes the piano player sound better. But the truth of that is that the music itself is the fourth member of that band. And everyone is watching and listening to the music to see where it goes. And they're all kind of got their eye on that. And then you're kind of taking care of your business here and you're making sure you know what's going on there. But this, it was everyone's listening to. And that experience, when you have that experience, playing this instrument with all the hours, the 20,000 hours you have to put in on it, when you have that kind of experience with that level of musician and then you're making that kind of music and then you're having that effect on people in the audience, you know. <laughs> That's that's you know that's some strawberry ice cream man. That's that's and that, that's what it's all about. <laughs> it is. I, it just is, and I just we just can't forget it. You know, while we're on our journeys, we're all on our journeys of you know I'm working on my single strokes and I'm working on my four limb coordination and I'm trying to get my hi hat to open and close. While you're doing that, keep listening to music, and while you're doing your gig, you know, just keep make sure you're listening to the person next to you and not thinking about what you're going to have on the break to eat or drink or, you know, the cute person in the audience or whatever. Right. You know what I mean? Be, be listening. And it's, it's so rewarding. It's just, it's what this really, really is at the core of what we're doing here. It's about being present, being in the moment and, and every bit of, that. and being every, there for the, for the music, not for ourselves. Every bit of that. Well, of that. man, I, I'm, I could, I could do this for another four hours. Um, but I, so think, I. I think we we're going to we're going to get wrapping up at this point. But um, I think this was an, an amazing conversation with you. And and uh, and I love listening to your perspective and what you bring to the table. I, I have more questions. I think we need to do a part two. And I, I, I often say this, but I think it needs to be done. So we may be I'd be calling you up for a part two, I think. I'm 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 here. I got time. And everyone, please, um, thank you. I really appreciate you coming. Come say hello on on Instagram and and Facebook and wherever it may be. But before you stop by and say hello to me, um, go find out who Arnie Lang was. Rest go in check. peace, Arnie Lang. Uh, there's a great photograph of um, on your website from an SEN. Where yeah. you were, you and Arnie were on the panel. Yeah, and Dom and I'm, Joe. I'm in the picture. I don't know, and it's <laughs> I saw it in your website today, and and I love that photo. I I, I need a copy of that photo. Um, and it's the phone. Just the best, just the best guy, and really the the embodiment of all of what we do. Really, I I mean, he played you know percussion in the Philharmonic for 40 years. Unbelievable. And, just played the just the most amazing music 
in, in the most amazing way. And he was a top flight educator. He created programs from scratch where there wasn't one. He's a manufacturer. He's an endorser. I mean, it's say. just everything we all aspire to do, Arnie did with just grace and humility and just the best guy, just the best. So yep. go check out Arnie Lang. Yeah, for sure. he's dearly missed by, by the entire drum community. Yeah. Um, and so if you're a youngin, go look him up and learn about Arnie, um, yeah. for sure. So I'm, I know, I feel grateful that we shared, you know, that evening together with him. Um, um, one of many, I'm sure. Um, but thanks you, thank you for being my guest, Jim. This was amazing. I, and, um, I, I, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, man. So uh, we'll we'll definitely do it again. Um, I'm gonna get the the links to all the PAS stuff, and I already posted your link to your website in the description of the video, but I'll Mike, also post all the PAS stuff. It is there, everybody. Say hello to everybody that's, you know, all the gear page and um, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let me know here. Drop me a line. If I can help you in any way, let's do it. Very good. All right, I'm going to roll the titles. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out. And Thank you. And I'll see you guys on the next one. Thanks, James. Take care.